Hey guys, it's Joshua Depp Dave channel, and today what we're going to be discussing is an engine that I wanted to make a video on several months ago. When I was making the video discussing the C13D, which is the new Caterpillar engine they're going to be coming out with for the industrial side, which is a rear gear train overhead cam engine, I learned that Caterpillar once had a rear gear train dual overhead cam engine. And if I tell you the specifications about it, it's a 14.6 liter engine, has a 5.4 inch bore with a 6.5 inch stroke. It's got a spacer plate. It has counter bores that can be done to it. You might be saying, well, what is this? Is it a 3406 with dual overhead cam and a rear gear train? That'd be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? What if I told you that they actually had this before the 3406? What? I mean, isn't rear gear train and dual overhead cam, isn't that kind of a new thing? Well, it seems like it because most manufacturers, CAT included, seems to be going rear gear train, overhead cam more often. But no, this engine actually came out way before the 3406. 3406 was designed in 1973, according to Caterpillar. So it's actually 50 years old as of today, this year, which is 2023. So happy birthday to the 3406. <laughs> but the engine I'm talking about, if you haven't guessed it already, is the 1693. Not an engine you see around very much, but a very, very interesting engine. So we're going to be discussing that today. And this engine was actually, it came out around 1964. So almost 10 years before the 3406. If you're not familiar with the term 1693, the equipment equivalent of this, basically almost the same engine was a D343, which it seems like that is a much more prevalent engine. And they made that for a much wider amount of time than they did the truck 1693. So 1693 is specifically a truck engine and actually has some interesting history and that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Now folks, I wasn't around in 1963 and definitely wasn't working on these when they came out. So most of this information I've gleaned from several places, research I've done online. John Goldsmith is a wealth of information. He sent me a whole list of interesting facts about this engine. Not only that, there's a YouTube channel called J Pay Dirt. Jeff, he actually lives in Idaho also, although he's not exactly my neighbor because Idaho is a pretty big state, but he's got basically a whole series uh, talking about these 1693s. And I watched all of the ones he was discussing. So let's talk about this engine a little bit. So like I already said, the 1693 came out in the early mid 60s, so around 1964. And Caterpillar in the 1950s didn't really have much of a presence from my understanding from the research I did online. In fact, if you're on the CAT website talking about trucking history, they don't even have a 1950s section. It kind of goes from the 1940s where it seemed like it was mostly actually gasoline engines and then jumps into the 1960s and the 1693 seems to be the big interesting engine of that time. And it seems like they were quite prevalent from the 60s and through the 70s. Now, one thing I, I learned immediately that was very interesting was these could have brake savers on them. Now, if you don't know what a brake saver is, I have a video discussing that, but Caterpillar did not have Jacob style compression brakes. They do now on their engines, but at the time they didn't have Jake brakes. So what they did was they actually had an oil converter retarder in the flywheel area, and they're very effective, although they're quite complicated, expensive, and can create a lot of mess when they leak. But these engines actually could have brake savers. I was under the understanding that the 3408s were the first ones that have brake savers, but I was wrong. Now you can kind of tell that the 1693 and the 3406 had the same design teams, or at least several of the ideas were the same, other than the rear gear train and the overhead cam design. That's because they have the same displacement, the same bore, and the same stroke, basically. Both are 5.4 inch bore, 6.5 inch stroke, 14.6 liter, Engines, 893 cubic inches. Now, they do differentiate in a lot of ways, though. And what we're going to be discussing here is the 1693. So what was the 1693? It was an inline-six diesel engine. I just gave you the bore and the stroke. They were pre-combustion chamber diesel engines, though. So were they very fuel efficient? No, they were not. <laughs> were they loud? Yes, they were. Did they make a lot of power? for the size. No, these being from the 60s were pre-combustion because direct injection wasn't as prevalent then. And the ability to make high pressure to make direct injection fuel systems wasn't really that common. 
So if you're not unfamiliar, a pre-combustion chamber is basically, instead of the fuel from the injector being sprayed directly into the cylinder, there's a small cavity either above or to the side of the cylinder, these are above them, where the fuel is sprayed directly into that, it starts the combustion process and then it is pushed into the combustion chamber where the cylinder is. So it's kind of a weird design. A uh, lot of early diesels had this. The 3306, for instance, had a pre-combustion design on the earlier models. And it wasn't very efficient for one reason in particular in that a lot of the heat that was supposed to be used to force the piston down was just generating heat and it was going into the pre-combustion cups themselves and then it was just going into the cooling system and Jay Pater was saying that generally these pre-combustion engines would have to have a larger than it would seem radiator because they pushed a lot more heat into the cooling system. Now of course that heat should have been turned into generating downforce for the driving of the vehicle but instead that's one of the reasons why they are not very fuel efficient. One thing I did want to mention before we get too far into this was Western States is giving away a basically a Christmas present bundle to one lucky person on this channel and I discussed this in the live stream we had on Wednesday but here is what you got to do. So here's what you can win and all you really have to do is listen to the live stream to learn how to basically throw your hat in the ring to win a hat, an electric uh, RC bulldozer, a cup, bunch of stuff. And the live stream tells you how to do it. If you already know how to do it, you will know the rules. But if you haven't watched the live stream I just did, good luck to those entering. You do need to live in the contiguous United States to win this and get it shipped out to you. How about a little destruction of the week before we get back to our topic at hand? This week's destruction leak comes from Chris, and Chris sent these pictures of a Cummins 9 liter, and this is the high pressure fuel pump, and a customer had installed it themselves, but they had used silicone for some reason around it, probably to double seal it. But they plugged the oil feed line to the pump, which resulted in the pump lifters, well, looking like this. Yeah! Now, let's talk about some of the interesting things about this engine that at least I find interesting. Yeah, they were dual overhead cam. They didn't have rocker arms. The camshafts almost directly drove the valves down for the head. And since they were gear train, all the timing was done on the back of the engine. Now, they weren't hydraulic lifter systems though. They were mechanical. So you still had to adjust the valves, but since the cams directly drove the valves basically, they had little puck looking things that had adjusters in them. And I actually had to get a cutaway from Cat to see what the heck they're talking about. I've never done an overhead on one. I've never worked on one. So it, I was quite inquisitive as to why, how actually you would adjust these. And yeah, they had like a pawl in them and you would put a screwdriver in and turn it to get your adjustment. And apparently the adjustments were 18 thousandths intake and 30 thousandths exhaust. And all of the truck ones had a 65B serial number designation. And one thing they did have that most cat diesel engines didn't have or haven't had, at least all the truck ones don't really have, glow plugs. These had glow plugs. And according to John Goldsmith, the glow plug system was 12 volts and most had a series parallel switch. Had four 6 volt batteries starting on 24 volts, converting to 12 volts when running. So cranking one in the winter, you would push it on the clutch uh, to press the throttle, spin the engine over for a little bit to put fuel on the piston. Now, the governor was a stop to prevent the throttle from opening up till oil pressure was achieved. Most people would turn the plunger around to prevent this. Once you, f once you had fuel on the piston, you would take your heat start switch, flip it to the heat side. A little cold, 30 seconds. Really cold, one minute. Then make an attempt to start the darn thing. So glow plugs had to be in good working order. I got an old snap on amp meter, you lay over the wire, winter time you would check the amp draw on the system, a good one pulled 60 amps. Pretty interesting, yeah, not, you don't really see glow plugs on, on highway trucks anymore and that was something that was common on these engines. Now I also, I already mentioned they had brake savers, they had a variety of horsepower that they could have, basically from 325 to 425 horsepower, uh, according to John Goldsmith here, uh, the 6093 was normally a 325 horsepower, uh, pre-combustion chamber uh, turbocharge after cooled was 425 horsepower. Uh, and he said there was a mix between there. 
Uh, what a lot of people did was take the 380 horsepower high torque engine, take the torque spring and put it in the 425 horsepower engine. My old boss who grew up on these said the cat offered this one time, but they must have removed it. It was a 440 horsepower engine, he said, but he's never seen that in print. Now, one thing he did mention, which I'm not a NASCAR fans, folks, but I have heard of Talladega uh, Speedway, and there's someone named Johnny Ray, and he runs a big old on highway truck around the lap before the start of each race apparently in 1975 he drove a tractor with the trailer on talladega going 92 miles an hour on the speedway and guess what engine he had in that truck it was a 1693 folks so pretty cool piece of history there for the 1693 it'll go on and live forever at least in that instance now if you're in a rear gear train it kind of makes me have to think about it differently on almost every instance. For instance, the oil pump would drive off the back of the engine for this instance. The water pump would drive off the back if it was gear driven, but it was a belt driven water pump and John Goldsmith seems to not like the water pump very much. He said the water pump weighed about 70 pounds, my God, and is belt driven. Bolts <laughs> you can't hit with a shotgun? Uh, I'm not sure why you'd be shooting the bolts with a shotgun though, John, come on. So uh, he said it was pretty much a full day to RNI water pump. You would think a belt driven water pump uh, would not be that much work, but he's done them I haven't folks. So uh, the Impella had a ceramic face glued on it. It falls off, you have to replace it. You have to set your impeller gap and torque the nut. Also, it has to be greased. You have to grease your water pump, folks. That's a, that's a little archaic design there. Now, while watching the video, especially John Paydirt's videos, uh, one thing I did notice was the fuel pump drive on these was really weird. It was gear driven, obviously, but since it drove from the back, uh, you know, rear gear train, it had an incredibly long housing before you actually got to the fuel pump. And I'm not really sure why Cat did that. Why not run the fuel pump directly off the rear of the engine. Maybe they wanted the fuel pump more centered to keep the fuel lines more consistent lengths. I, I'm not really sure why Cap did that. It seems like a really unusual design. One other thing it said is you can pull the pistons off because you can get to the rod caps without pulling the oil pan. I said, well, how would you do that? There's actually a large cover on the side of the engine you can unbolt, which I don't know if that's much easier than pulling the oil pan, but um, you can unbolt that and get to the rod caps in the right position to remove them. Obviously, you'll still have to pull the head off to get them out of there, but you could actually pull the cylinder packs out that way. Now, these are apparently very leaky engines. I mean, gasket technology at the time was not that great. And according to John, you have to use uh, either a green or an orange glue on almost all the gaskets to even get them to try and not leak. So not the best design on as far as that goes but you know we're talking 60 year old engine technology folks it's not like all the new cars then either were just pristine running vehicles um, what i found was this engine super interesting though and what i'm wondering is why didn't cat stick with this and just update it to a direct injection obviously they went to the 3406 after this about 10 years after but they kept most of the same designs for the 3406 as far as the displacement it has a spacer plate between the head. They could have made it a pushrod engine maybe, or maybe they were like, you know what? We don't want a rear gear train. We don't want an overhead cam engine. It's just too much trouble. Let's go with a whole new design. Now, one thing I was hearing, uh, especially uh, Jay Pater talks about this a lot, was going to a direct injection system, you need larger rod and main bearings, particularly rod bearings, because it puts a lot more force on the connecting rod and the rod bearings during the direct injection opposed to the pre-combustion uh, ignition process. So you would have to get bigger rod journals, which would be hard to fit into an engine you've already designed. How would you get more space between them? And apparently parts on these are very expensive. I'm not sure how much they are now, but John was saying in his email that several years ago, a set of rod bearings and an oil pan gasket was cheaper for a 3406 than just the rear main thrust bearing in a 1693. So combine that with them being relatively low power for their displacement. Not only that, they are louder. Uh, they were called clatter pillars for a reason. And their ability to get very poor mileage. I think that kind of doomed these, that they were really amazing for their time. 
being the 60s for diesel technology. Remember, folks, diesel technology, it's been slower going than the gasoline world just because it's a it's a smaller industry, right? I mean, not generally. There's a lot less trucks than automotive and a lot less changes. So very cool engine, though. I, I Maybe one day I'll get to work on one or at least see one. They are very cool from what I've seen. And uh, glad I was able to do all the research on them and find out a lot more about them. Hopefully you guys find them interesting. If you do want to watch, of course, go to uh, Jay Paydirt's channel. Say thanks to John Goldsmith. He gave me a ton of information on these. Uh, a lot of stuff, you know, I've never worked on them. And uh, thanks for watching. 